Welcome, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. First, a quick programming note. I will be taking off from the podcast next week in celebration of Memorial Day weekend. So no chess, no podcast, no graduate school work. I'm basically hitting the off switch and spending time with family and friends. It'll be a four-day weekend for me, so I'm looking forward to that. So the next new episode will be two weeks from the release date of this one. Now, this week is a reboot, if you will, an updated version of episode one of this podcast. It's not a sequel or a completely new episode. I'm essentially redoing it, sort of like the second edition of a book. Now, that episode alone, just the first episode of this podcast, has about 40,000 downloads to date, and it keeps increasing each week. Kind of crazy, but I do feel that it needs to be redone. I don't know, it just kind of bothered me. I was just getting into podcasting and just some of the pacing, some of the production notes. So I've always wanted to redo it. It's been on my list. So finally, I'm getting down to taking care of that. Now, I think it has so many downloads, probably not so much the subject matter, maybe because it's shorter, people like that, but also it's our very first episode. So a lot of people are probably checking out the pod, which is fantastic. So please enjoy the revised version of episode one of this podcast, Chess Openings and the Amateur Player. That's coming up. Welcome to the Chess Angle. This is not your typical chess podcast. If you're an amateur or club level player, the Chess Angle is for you. Our content is aimed at busy adults who are serious about the game but have limited study time. Featured guests include both amateur and titled players alike. And now, here's your host, director of the Long Island Chess Club, Neil Bellon. Welcome, everyone, to the Chess Angle Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. This episode and the entire podcast, really, is aimed at club players and adult improvers who are dedicated to the game but have limited study time. That's really the theme here with this podcast. Now, this week's episode, our very first episode, is going to be a general sort of rapid-fire overview of openings, not really a deep dive. I'll be doing some specific episodes in the future that will dive into specific openings and we'll look at them in detail. But for this week, this is going to be sort of a Wikipedia entry, sort of a general overview, really some thoughts on opening philosophy and opening approaches and opening choices for the amateur player. So let's jump right in. So let's start with some general remarks about the opening. First, let's discuss the purpose or the main idea behind the opening. It's not simply to just sort of move your pieces and develop them. The purpose of the opening is to get a playable middle game. Simple as that. If you reach the middle game and your position is equal, slightly better, or much better, then your opening was successful. And you always want to play to win regardless of which color you have. Don't get into this, well, I want to win as white and draw as black. That's really something that takes place at the highest levels, like when two grandmasters play. At the amateur level, always play to win regardless of which color you have. I'm going to speak a little bit more about colors, like whether you have white or black, and some myths associated with that. That's going to be coming up in a moment. And understand that I'm sharing my thoughts as a player, as a tournament director, as someone who runs a weekly chess club and has seen countless amateur games. So I'm sharing, I'm not telling, right? Nothing I'm saying is Bible. I'm just kind of sharing my thoughts based on my experiences. So now let's get into some general themes and ideas about openings. So the first theme I want to talk about is the idea of which color you have, specifically the idea that white, quote unquote, has the advantage, right? Like you have the advantage because you have the white pieces. It is my firm contention that at the amateur level, that is utter nonsense. 
there is absolutely no advantage to having the white pieces at the amateur level. Now, let me kind of explain that. Let me parse my answer. Now, chess theory has shown us that, yes, white technically has a very slight advantage, obviously because he moves first, right? He has the first move, so technically black is kind of playing catch up. But when we say white has that advantage from moving first, that is with perfect or near perfect play by both players. However, at the amateur level, and when I say the amateur level, I mean even like under 2200, but definitely under 2000. At the amateur level, the games are riddled with mistakes. It might be really overt and obvious mistakes. It might be more subtle mistakes. But most amateur games are riddled with mistakes. So any advantage by white, any possible advantage by white is completely negated. Now, I remember reading an article in Chess Life many years ago. I wish I remembered who it was. But it was a high-profile player who was basically saying this in detail, that the whole idea that white has an advantage at the amateur level is completely overblown. And obviously, I agree with that. Now, some players are uncomfortable with the black pieces, or they don't study enough with the black pieces, and that translates into white has an advantage. But the truth is, they need to learn their openings as black better. Now, I have players at the club all the time, like when the pairings go up, oh, great, I have white, but it's completely misguided. I mean, if you have a 1500 versus another 1500 player, let's say, guy with the white pieces doesn't have an advantage, not at that level, all right? I mean, if two GMs are going at it, that's a different conversation, but at the club level, definitely not. The next idea is really a suggestion. And that is to avoid theoretically complicated openings, such as the Sicilian defense and other sharp openings. I don't think it's a good idea if you're an improver, if you're a beginner, if you're an advanced beginner, that type of thing, because they tend to get people into a lot of trouble. I would consider playing a system or a thematic opening instead. You don't have to, but it's something I'm suggesting, something I think that you should check out. And these system or thematic openings are especially good for busy adults. Now, let me define what I mean by a system opening and a thematic opening. They're not quite the same thing, but they're related. Now, a system opening, such as the London system or the Collie system, you probably heard of them. That's an opening where you're more concerned about achieving a certain structure, a certain formation, right? You want certain pieces to go on certain squares. And as such, there's a lot of flexibility in the move order. As long as you get that structure, as long as you end up there, how you get there is not always that important. I mean, yeah, there's going to be some theory, but generally speaking, there's some flexibility in the move order and they're easy to learn, easy to understand, but yet still very solid. Now, a thematic opening is similar, but there's a little more theory involved. It's not quite as flexible, but with thematic openings, the ideas are very clear. And I'll give some specific examples when I talk about my own repertoire in a moment, and that should make things a little clearer. Now, the next idea, this is very, very important. I feel it is essential as you grow as a player to develop what I call a forever repertoire. That is, pick the same openings and stick with them. Now, this takes time to build through playing experience. You're not going to sit down on a Saturday morning and figure this out in 20 minutes. This comes from playing in tournaments, from studying, from trial and error. But eventually, you're going to get to a point where you're going to figure out what works for you and what you like and just stick with them. Now, I'm reminded and those of you who are around you know, my age range will remember this, there was a famous TV personality, an infomercial guy named Ron Papil. And in the late 90s, they came out with this product called the Showtime Rotisserie and Barbecue, right? You would put a chicken in it, and it would come out perfect, like you'd make your own rotisserie chicken. And the big catchphrase, it's one of the most famous infomercial phrases ever, was, Set it and forget it, right? You would buy this Showtime rotisserie 
And that was the big catchphrase, set it and forget it, right? You'd put the chicken in it or whatever meat you were cooking, you would turn the dial and then that was it, right? Big, big catchphrase. Those of you who have been around like me, you probably know what I'm talking about. So why am I mentioning that? That's what you want to do with your opening repertoire. You want to set it and forget it. Figure out what your opening repertoire is going to be and just stick with it. And this way you can just kind of tweak it and do some brush up things rather than trying all these different openings and you're constantly driving yourself crazy. When you have a set repertoire and you set it and forget it, you can then spend your time studying other things that you probably need, that most improvers probably need to improve on, such as you know avoiding blunders and tactics and end games, middle games, things of that nature. So the advantage, just to review, of having a set repertoire where you play the same openings is a number of things. Number one, you'll be more familiar with the setups and the positions. So you'll understand what to do, right? That's the whole point of opening study. And because of that, you will then save time on your clock, which is huge because time pressure is a major cause of many, many lost games at the amateur level. Now, to sort of validate what I'm saying, even Bobby Fischer, right, one of the greatest, some would say the greatest, did this, right? He played the same openings. He very rarely strayed from his set repertoire. I mean, think about it. He opened with E4. I mean, there are some games on record where he played D4, but most of the time he was an E4 player, right? He's the one who said E4 was best by test. And against D4, when he had the black pieces, against D4, he would pretty much always play the King's Indian defense. And against E4, he would play the Knight of Sicilian. And he very rarely strayed from that. And that was Fisher. Now, two more points before I discuss my own repertoire. Just some ideas to think about with the opening. The main idea with the opening, traditionally, is to control the center, right? And when I say traditionally, White wants to get in E4 and D4, right? He wants to get in those two center pawns. So White's goal is to play E4 and D4. Black wants to prevent that. That's the basis of most of the mainstream openings, right? So when White plays E4, Black plays E5, right? Because he's preventing D4, et cetera, et cetera. And there are other openings such as the French defense and the Carol Khan, which I'll talk about in a minute. Those are sort of counterattacking openings where you allow White to get an E4 and D4, but then you counterattack it. But the general idea is that you either want to prevent White from getting in E4 and D4, or if you allow him to do that, you attack it. And that's really the main idea with openings. I'm kind of oversimplifying it, but I just want to give you the general schematic. The other idea, and this is something I see as someone who runs a chess club, you need to know exactly what you're going to open with when you sit down to play a chess game. So if you're at a tournament and you have the white pieces, you have to know exactly what you're going to open with. Like, are you going to open with E4? Are you going to open with D4? And if you open with E4, however black plays, are you going to know how to respond? So if you play E4 and he plays the French, you need to know how you're going to respond. If you play E4 and he plays the Sicilian, you need to know how you're going to respond. That's one of the things I like about system openings, because if you play a system opening, you can pretty much do it no matter how your opponent responds. But the point I'm trying to make is that you need to know exactly what you're going to play, both as black and as white. And the reason I'm mentioning this, I can't tell you how many games I've seen where it's move one and the player is like scratching his head what he's going to play. Even experienced tournament players, I'm not just talking about beginners. I mean, if, if a beginner, if someone playing in his first tournament's a little confused in the opening, that's to be expected. But I'm talking about experienced tournament players, 1,400, 1,500 around there, you know, higher or lower, but all levels really, where they're like deciding what to play. And I, I've always wondered about that because you're wasting time needlessly. You need to know exactly how you're going to respond before you sit down. I mean, the only exception would be if your opponent like goes off book very, very early and you know, you kind of have to improvise from the beginning. But 
those are exceptions. Most of the time, you know, like if you have the black pieces, your opponent's going to open with, you know, E4 or D4 or C4, Knight F3, standard things. And I just think some people are too indecisive. I'd now like to discuss my own opening repertoire. Now, you don't have to play the openings that I do. I'm simply sharing this as something for you to think about and compare to your own. And hopefully my story might help you in some way. Now, I developed this after years of trial and error, after years of kind of falling on my face and figuring out what works for me. Now, the openings that you choose for yourself, they need to be based on your style, on the type of game you like, and the amount of study time that you have or that you're willing to put in. All right, so all of these factors need to come into play. Now, for white, I do play the London system. I mentioned system openings earlier. I've been playing it for years before it was mainstream. When I was playing it, a lot of people didn't even know what it was. So no one can accuse me of sort of being a front runner with that because I know the London is very popular now. But I was playing it long before Again, it was as mainstream as it is now. And what happened was with the London system, and again, I'm not going to really do a deep dive into these openings, but just as a general overview, for many years, the London was viewed as sort of this harmless sideline, right? Like the London, the Kali, you know, all these D4 sidelines. Like if you put a London system game in a chess engine, it would say like something like, you know, miscellaneous sidelines. And it wasn't viewed as something bad. It was just viewed as sort of this harmless thing that maybe some beginners or amateurs would use. But then what happened was, as stronger players started using it, people realized like, wait a minute, uh, this London system, yeah, it's not really this like harmless opening and you can really have some crazy attacks. You can play it solidly. And I think the most important thing is if your opponent is not paying attention or goes on autopilot, you can really steamroll your opponent, you know, if I'm being honest. Now, what happened was Gatikamski is probably the big pioneer of the modern London system. He sort of popularized it. But now, of course, Magnus uses it, Jiri. A lot of the pros use it as well. They tend to use it more in blitz games and quicker time controls, but even in slower games, they're using it. So the idea that the London is a quote-unquote beginner opening is really utter nonsense. It's extremely effective at the amateur level. It's a fantastic opening. It's solid. It's easy to learn. Now, I realize with the London and system openings in general, but especially the London, there is a lot of criticism. People will claim that it's boring. People will say, oh, it's like the same thing over and over. People will claim that it's like going to hurt your development as a player. I really think that stuff is kind of nonsense. I'm not going to get into it now. I'm going to do a separate episode on the London system where I will address that in detail. But I really think the criticism of it is unfounded. And here's where it comes from. Many players with the black pieces hate facing it. They just don't like facing it because it can be very tricky. And so rather than admit, you know what, it's a tough opening to play against, they just say, oh, it's a bad opening. But I completely disagree. I had a lot of success with it. Early in my tournament career, I was playing E4 and I was getting crushed, just wasn't happening. Now, the argument could be, though, you know, I was also a much weaker player earlier in my career. So if I took up E4 now, I might have more success. That's a fair criticism, but I've just had so much fun and so much success with the London that for me to change it doesn't make sense. And the idea that all, all your games are, you know, quote unquote, the same when you play the London, again, that's just utter nonsense because I'm not finding that. I mean, all my Londons are different. They all go in different directions. It might start out the same, but, you know, you get some really fun positions. You can have some wild attacks. And you can also have some slow positional games, which is what I tend to favor. And it can be played either way. The London can be played aggressively, it can be played quietly. Magnus has done both even. You know, Magnus Carlsen, he'll attack, he'll do like an early H4, 
but he'll also do some strategic trades and sort of trade down into a better end game where he'll grind his opponent down, very Fisher-like. So there's a lot of things you can do with it. So I highly recommend it. That's my entire white repertoire is the London. That's the beauty of it. No matter what black plays, I can do it. Whereas if I play E4, if he plays C5, I got to learn the Sicilian now. If I play E4 and he plays E6, I have to learn the French, right? If I play E4 and he plays C6, I now have to learn the Karo Khan. You get the idea. Whereas with the London, I can pretty much do it no matter how black responds. That's why I'm a fan of system openings. Again, that's just me. I'm not saying you have to do that or it's the only way to play, but it's something that you might want to consider and look into. Now, with the black pieces, against e4, I play e6, which is the French defense. And against d4, I do either the Nimzo or the Queen's Indian, both very, very solid openings. Now, we can argue about the London, but the French and the Nimzo and the Queens, those are solid at all levels. Those are beyond reproach. I mean, if anybody criticizes those openings, you have to start to question their, you know, credibility. Now, I sometimes get asked, well, Neil, what about all these D4 sidelines, right? Because what if your opponent plays D4, but then he doesn't play C4? Good question. Against D4 sidelines, I usually use the Queen's Indian as a universal system because you go Knight F6, and then you go b6 and you fiend kettle the bishop. It works very well. For example, if I'm facing a London system, I'll often go into a Queen's Indian. Queen's Indian works very well against the London. Or if he just does something unusual after d4, again, I can kind of use a Queen's Indian or kind of a hedgehog structure as a universal system. Now, some other choices, the Karo Khan, you may want to look into. That's very good against e4. Like that would be my alternate recommendation if you don't play the French. I've been doing the French for so many years that I'm probably not going to change it. But I know a number of players at the club who use the Cairo Khan. Very solid. I would highly recommend that. I don't think it's going to get you into trouble the way the Sicilian defense will. And against c4, the English opening, I usually play b6 right away and then fiend kettle my bishop. And that usually ends up transposing into a Nimzo or a Queens anyway, which is what I try to do. So you'll notice that the black openings I play are what I would call thematic. The Nimzo Indian, Queens Indian, and the French defense, those aren't really system openings, but they're thematic openings because the ideas are very clear. And there is some flexibility in the move order a little bit, not quite as much as a system opening, but like I said, the ideas are very easy to understand with black, which is what you want, okay? I just use the term thematic opening and system opening kind of separately. I mean, I'm sure there's some hair splitting as to what they mean, but that, that's just how I define them. So again, as I mentioned, I'm going to be doing separate sort of deep dive episodes on each of these openings in the future. This episode is more of just a condensed idea or a condensed philosophy, I should say, about the opening approach and your thought process at the amateur level and how to sort of develop a repertoire. All right, so this is a general overview. I'm not saying the openings I play, you have to play too. These openings work for me based on the study time that I have or don't have, based on my style and my personality. I tend to be more of a quiet positional player. I kind of like the slow maneuvering. So if you're the opposite of that, then you know you might want to change your repertoire. Although whether you're an attacking player or a solid positional player, you can actually still use the same openings that I do, but just look at some different variations. If you really are into tactics and you feel you excel in those sort of wild open positions, you can just play different variations of the same openings that will lead to that kind of game. And now some book recommendations. I will link all of these in the show notes. So for my opening repertoire as white, for those of you interested, now obviously this is a little bit biased because I'm just going to be discussing the London system. 
The book that I recommend, it's a newer one. This is my new favorite book on the London. It's called The London System in 12 Practical Lessons by Oscar de Prado. And it's really organized by the main themes or ideas in the London. It's not so much variations, but it goes by sort of the ideas. Outstanding book for club players of all levels. The next one I would recommend, and this is sort of the classic book, is Win With the London System by Johnson and Kovacevic. That one's a little more technical. The first part is illustrative games with annotations. And the second part is sort of a list of different variations and different lines. So if your opponent throws something at you in a tournament game and you weren't sure, you can look up that specific line in the second half of the book. Now, if there were such a thing as a college course on the London system, that book by Johnson and Kovacevic would probably be the textbook for it because it's kind of written in that sort of style. If you want something that's a little more breezy, but yet still very, very good and will give you all the main ideas that you need, check out that first one, The London System and 12 Practical Lessons. And then the other one I would recommend, this one is more illustrative games with annotations, is Play the London System by Cyrus Lakdawalla. But again, if there's only one book you want on it, I would get The London System and 12 Practical Lessons by De Prado. That's my new favorite London book. Now, with the black pieces, I use the Starting Out series, which is outstanding. The prose, the explanations, the diagrams, it is a fantastic book series for opening play at the amateur level. It explains the ideas very well. Now, I only use them for my openings as black simply because these other books covered me for the white pieces. But regardless of what opening you use, let's say you play something other than the London system is white, you can still use the starting out series. It's fantastic. But the one on the French defense, starting out the French, is written by Byron Jacobs, the one on the Nimzo Indian by Chris Ward, and the one on the Queens Indian by John Ems. Again, I'll put links for all of these. But the starting out series by Everyman Chess is outstanding. Now, I just wanted to recommend books because I kind of like that as a starting point. I know there's all sorts of things online and I use those as well. You have Chessable, you have chess.com, even like YouTube videos. But what I like to do for openings, I like to have at least one book as sort of a base. And then I use the online stuff as sort of a supplement. That's just me, but I just wanted to go by book recommendations. That's kind of what I wanted to stick with. I think most of the online stuff you can probably just, you know, look it up and it's it's right there. You know, like if you go on Chessable, just type in the opening you want and there's plenty of material there or on chess.com, whatever site that you use. So now let me summarize the key points of this episode. Just some key ideas to remember. So first, the purpose of the opening is to get a playable middle game. That's your goal right? If you're equal, slightly better, or much better, your opening was a success. The other idea that's very important, it is my firm belief that there is no advantage to having the white pieces at the amateur level. That's a myth. That's in your head. I truly believe that. The next idea, you want to avoid complicated theoretical openings. You don't have to rely on a system opening like I do, like the London system. But it's an idea, but do what works for you, okay? System openings are an excellent option because it gives you time to work on other things. See, the reason system openings are good for improvers is because at that level, there are so many other things you have to work on. And if you're trying to sort of force feed yourself these complicated openings, you're going to take time away, time that you don't have from studying tactics, which is what you need, or studying basic endgame ideas, studying basic mates, working on your calculation, things of that nature. And the last thing, you want to develop a forever repertoire, right? Set it and forget it. Play the same openings and just stick with them. And then as you become really familiar and really good at them, you'll understand the positions and you just got to kind of, you know, tweak it. You won't have to spend countless hours on opening study 
And you can spend time on other things, as I said, like tactics, analyzing your games, things like that. So that is our very first episode. Hopefully you will continue listening to the podcast. There are a lot of solo episodes, but we also have guests, both titled players and amateurs. So it's a good mix. And every episode is focused on the club level player and adult improvers. Now, if you're enjoying the podcast, be sure to spread the word on your social media accounts. And please consider leaving us a five-star review on Apple or Spotify. Takes just a moment, but it really goes a long way in supporting us. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you win your next game. Have a great day, everybody. (laughs) 